Peter Ballastet advocates for ruminant ag agriculture's role in human nutrition and sustainability, sharing knowledge globally. Please welcome Peter Ballastet. Howdy, everybody. Oh, that was all right. Yeah, glad to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the organizers, everybody, the sponsors, but most of all, thank you for showing up because you're sponsors too, and it would be really weird if the room was empty. Um, so yes, my name's Peter Ballerstead. Um, I've been fumbling around in the therapeutic carbohydrate reduction space um, of one form or another since 2007. Um, I've been speaking publicly, advocating for this since 2010. Most of my adult life's been spent in forage agriculture. Um, I have posted a link that can, to a folder of all my presentation materials. Um, it will be on the last slide, uh, and also it's all over my social media and in the Whova app. So, um, points I hope to leave you with today. Uh, the status of humanity's food supply, the reality of malnutrition across the world, that the metrics and the words we use matter, and they matter particularly when we get into things, conversations about sustainable food systems and sustainable health care. We uh, get into that. Um, the reality that we can encounter or create unintended barriers to adoption of therapeutic carbohydrate reduction or therapeutic nutritional ketosis, and the practical importance of improving our own health and helping others do the same, right? Nobody's coming, right? It's us. Um, don't outsource your health care. And when you improve your health, you are improving the world. So first, the status of humanity's food supply, it's already plant-based. Next. <laughs> so I have three fundamental beliefs. One is that animal source foods are essential for human health and flourishing, in other words, for public health that if we restrict animal source foods further, we will not improve public health. Number two, that livestock in general, ruminants in particular, are essential to sustainable food systems. Okay? And number three is that animal source foods are part of our ancestral heritage and our cultural heritage, regardless of where that heritage springs from. Okay, so maybe I should just make it clear that Meat is an animal source food, but not all animal source foods are meat. And yes, beef is a red meat, but all red meats are not beef. Okay, so we, we need to get better with our language because I think that gets in our way sometimes. So let me just spend a bit of time looking at this slide because it's really a shame and a scandal. Um, how many people here are satisfied with 76 grams of protein, note the air quotes, per day? That's the U.S. protein, in quotes, food supply. And if you don't understand why I'm putting the scare quotes around protein, um, in my presentation materials, I have a list of resources and references, and one of them is a talk that I gave that's low carb down under, and it goes into great depth, more than I have time for here. Um, but it's not protein. That's just the short thing. Um, and, and note global 34 grams, and note that this is even that 76 grams per person per day food supply is only 60% coming from animal source foods. We're clearly suffering from essential amino acid deficits for a significant portion of the American public, let alone globally. Um, and then we shouldn't talk about protein in terms of calories, but we do, so here's another FAO estimate of the protein supply in terms of calories per day. And in the U.S., 29% of our daily calories come from pro animal protein. So 
2,000 Cordainian colleagues released a study of ancestral diets where they said that 30% of calories from animal source foods was an ancestral minimum. That the ranges were from 30% to 100% with the mean at 70. Okay, Nordhagen four years ago and their colleagues came up with an estimate that said when we drop below 30% of calories from animal source foods in a population's diets, we see rapidly increasing numerous micronutrient deficiencies. We're at 29. A fifth of women of childbearing age in the U.S. are anemic. Less animal source food is not a good idea in the U.S., let alone globally. So, Flourishing requires nourishing. If we don't feed the brains properly as they develop, they never catch up. These human beings' potential is inhibited from the start. And this is not a heavy lift. We can do this. You know, what's so frustrating is this isn't a scientific issue. It's a political issue. It's a, it's a belief system issue. It's an economic issue. It's all these other things. It's not science. We have the data, okay? But let's get aware of the data so we can argue more effectively. It's important to remember that you can be overfed and undernourished. And maybe what we eat influences what we eat, yes? Come on. Thank you. Wow, it's way too long after lunch, man. That crash is gone. So, well, come on, brother. So, all right, get up and dance, man. Just up and down the aisle. So the problem is that, again, words mean things. And so malnutrition exists in a spectrum and it manifests differently depending on where we are in the world. And it can range from stunting and wasting, quashiorcor, anemia, uh, anemia, to obesity, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome. It's all obesity. And yet within the communities that deal with food system conversations and food policies, they refer to obesity as overnutrition. So the conventional wisdom needs to be slain. So please keep at it. Find ways to get that into the literature because it's a desperate thing. I'm dealing with people who are quite sincere. They're dealing with the information that they were taught, so. Again, words mean things. The metrics we use mean things. And we need to make sure that we know what other people mean when they use a word that we use. Because it's not always the same definition. Let me give you an example. <laughs> Nutrient density is a real hot topic. I, I twitch a little less now when I hear it. I'm recovering. <laughs> per the USDA HHS official dietary guidelines definition of nutrient dense, it's explicitly low fat. They don't consider fat a nutrient. Okay, so long as I know what you mean by it, then we can have a conversation. I sure wouldn't want to agree with that. Well, you apply that, I just flashed somebody, sorry about that. Um, I mean with this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so you, uh, they apply that kind of logic and they come up with this nonsense where they're going to help us poor ignorant citizens figure out what to eat where this is the typical food and this is the nutrient dense version that we should eat more of. So the frosted mini wheats is typical but the unfrosted is nutrient dense. Oh, but wait, it gets better. Over here, we've got butter as being typical, vegetable oil, sorry, not vegetable, industrial oil, is nutrient dense. And, and the one that just, 
So soda is the typical, and sparkling water is nutrient dense. I love me sparkling water. It's one of my favorite drinks. I rarely get into trouble when I have that at night. But WTF nutrient dense. I'm just an agronomist. Somebody help me out with this stuff. I have a phrase, <laughs> bovine fecal matter. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so let's make, you know, you're driving through the mountains. There's always the chance of a rock slide. That's why they put the little signs up there, right? To tell the rocks where to fall. You don't see as many of those in Iowa. But let's not go scaling the cliff and kicking rocks loose, right? Some of this stuff is gonna happen anyway. I'm optimistic, I'm not naive. But let's see if we can't find a way to have better conversations, more meaningful conversations, build bridges with one another. So, some thoughts. You may be the only example they ever see. So please make it a good example. Don't, don't you be a barrier. And maybe we need to spend some time thinking about how adult humans learn and, and psychology and how to approach someone, right? If we're gonna work well in this space, we're gonna walk up against some sincere, highly educated people. Starting the conversation with everything you think you know is wrong probably isn't gonna go very far. And if I'm remembering it properly, depending on how we engage in this process, we may, may make them more resistant to change. So maybe we should spend some time looking into that if we're gonna get into this space of advocacy. But again, the true goal is improving metabolic health for as many people as possible. I would say everyone. Why not? Dream big. So please don't chase anyone away. I'm gonna spend more time on this. Practical importance of improving your own health and helping other people do the same. Nothing keeps it vital in yourself like seeing other people have the experience. And all we're doing for most of us, we're not medical professionals. I'm certainly not, I'm not that kind of doctor. I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> Let's pass this on in the spirit of generosity. Let's think about how we can be attractive rather than promotive. I mean, I don't know about you, but when somebody starts really doing the hard sell on me, the left hand goes to the back left pocket, and I kind of, yeah, all right, later. Maybe I'll come back to you, just maybe not. Okay, so that's one. How about this for an idea? Your local libraries, do they have copies of Professor Bickman's book? So buy it. I mean, I don't know how you do that, so find out, right? Find out what they have. Find out who's in charge at home. Now, you see, the difference between Nancy, my wife, and I is she's the kind of person, if she sees a book she wants to read, she goes online and sees it if it's in the card catalog at the library. That was an acronym, wasn't it? Card catalog online. Um, I'm an old fart, so sue me. Um, and if they have it, you know, then she checks it out, gets reserved, whatever. If they don't have it, she puts in a request for them to buy it. And she's got such a good record of the books that she requests that they buy, suddenly having six people check, you know, waiting list on it. So they know they can trust her. I'm the kind of person, if I see a book I want to read, I go online to Amazon. Um, it's a difference. So are there ways to make sure that the information's available for people who would be looking at various sources? Um, you know, grow where you're planted, bloom where you're planted. 
we're all uniquely qualified and positioned. These are some wonderful pictures from my memory of things I've gotten to do internationally and nationally <clears throat> because of my background, because of my experience, because of the information you people share with me. So I'm just trying to pass it along to them, and then I try to bring back information to you, like if you're worried about cow burps, let me just assure you that if it were possible to have the average adult American with type 2 diabetes eliminate their medication use, yeah, let's just blue sky this thing. Let's imagine that such a thing is even possible. That would result in a larger reduction in their carbon footprint than if they shifted from a high meat to a vegan diet. This is not a scientific issue. This is something else. So this is this nice native grassland. There's lots of plants that make up that healthy grassland, lots of diversity. And all of them are necessary in their own way and they serve their own function and some are gonna grow taller than others. That doesn't make one more important than another. They're all necessary. But from the ground up, I think, is what I want to push for. Uh, we need people doing the science? Absolutely. We need people affecting policy change? Absolutely. And then for the rest of us, you know, some people would rather watch a sermon than listen to one. So you have no idea who's watching you all the time. So what kind of food do you take to the potlucks? So if we're going to be citizen scientists, let's become better citizens. Oh, am I that over? Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. Um, talk to me about land-grant universities. Talk to me about the extension service. Whatever county you live in, there's an office you can go to to get information. I want people to start working that system backwards. I want you to get familiar with who's in that office. I want you to then, over time, start asking them, what kind of information do you have for diabetes? You know, diabetes is a big problem in our community. So how can we push this upstream? And imagine that you had the possibility to tap into 3,140 some offices across the United States that was dedicated to reach all audiences across those communities. And that's what we have the chance to do. So I hope if anybody's interested, more information, if you're a professional, talk to me. There's a pilot project that we're trying to form. Um, and I apologize for going long. Um, so here's my social media contact information, also the uh, URL for the um, folder of my presentation materials. Thank you very much.